Hey guys, and welcome back to the channel. Today, we're going back to our roots and having a look at some antique clothing in my collection. After my conversation with Robin and doing all this research into aesthetics, it just really made me interested in tea gowns, and I thought it would be just kind of fun to sort of continue this conversation on aestheticism and aesthetic dress by looking at this tea gown I have in my collection. Before we get into it though, I do want to give a quick shout out to the sponsor of this week's video, Squarespace. So friends, the time has come for me to finally get my stuff together and create a website where I can share videos, photos, and more. I had already decided on using Squarespace to create and host my website, so it was quite serendipitous when they reached out to me about sponsoring this video. They have gorgeous templates that fit all sorts of needs from a portfolio or blog, an online store, or the new membership only area, which is a perfect place to build your online community. Squarespace makes it so simple to create a space on the internet that looks beautiful on a browser as well as on your phone or iPhone iPad, because let's be honest, there's nothing more cringy than a website that doesn't work with mobile. Currently, I'm working on building my own website, and hopefully I'll be able to launch it soon. If you're looking to build yourself a new website or online store, head on over to squarespace.com slash abbycox to save 10% off of your first purchase of a website or domain using the code abbycox. Thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring this week's video. The tea gown emerged in the mid to late 1800s when afternoon tea, usually occurring around 5 p.m. in the afternoon, became popular with women of certain social classes as not only a social and networking event, but also as a way to prevent the hunger pains that could occur before a late dinner. Since afternoon tea, not high tea, please don't call it high tea, it's not high tea, uh, that's a random Abby pet pee for you there, it's not high tea guys, there was this odd balance of both a public and a private event. The clothing that the hostess could and would wear reflected this odd sartorial situation. Dr. Dr. Bissonnette argues that tea gowns existing in this odd space not only allowed for the wearer more creative freedom in fashion, but also helped, quote, push fashion forward away from the hourglass figure and towards a silhouette that embraced a new form of historicism, an Edwardian aesthetic and lighter color palette, and a broader acceptance of exoticism. These aesthetic influences are what denotes a tea gown away from the other styles of dress. Additionally, according to Dr. Bissonnette, because these tea gowns were worn in this liminal space of private and public, they could and did qualify as three different levels of formality, informal undress to semi-formal half-dress all the way up through full formal dress. This wibbly wobbly timey wininess of tea gowns is another example of their uniqueness within the Victorian society and their impact on fashion. For this video specifically, what makes this orange silk creation a tea gown is its Watteau back, the princess line cut which was most commonly used for interior gowns, and the aesthetic smocking treatment on the sleeves which, as we learned in last week's video on aesthetic dress, is a hallmark of the aesthetic historicism influence. Further, this tea gown's use of very lightweight silk fabric, no boning, and smaller skirts are also in keeping with Victorian aestheticism's sartorial preferences. While tea gowns are a bit of an oddity, they are an important part of Western Euro-American fashion, women, and societal histories. So let's look at this thing, huh? She is made out of a very lightweight, China weight silk, so she's very flowy, she's very light, she's very soft. There's not a lot of weight in this garment. She is two types of silk on the front. We have this gorgeous printed silk in just orange and white with a flower motif. And then we also have a solid in um, orange silk as well. And the orange silk is much lighter, it's much gauzier, but it's still a plain woven China weight silk. It's not like an organza or a chiffon. It still is actually very closely woven. It's not sheer but it's just a little bit lighter than the printed silk. She is center front closing with buttons up the center front and then she has this very full, she's not even actually in her center front right now. She has this very full gathered part here in the front that comes over and hides the center front button closures. There were hooks and eyes on the side here that they would connect to so then it would just kind of be hidden inside of here. Now, inside. First thing that's interesting about this is her lining is also printed cotton. It's super cute, it has these little leaves on it, but it's still the normal kind of brown, almost polished cotton that you see throughout the Victorian era. The skirts are lined in a darker brown polished cotton that's not printed, so it's not quite as nice. Yeah, she's just normal machine sewn, and if you guys are curious to know, her bobbin thread and her top thread are different colors, so if you do that yourself, don't feel bad. <laughs> they did it too. 
good. <laughs> so actually her seam allowances are, are notched and bound. Like they're really nicely done, but she has no boning in this garment at all. Like there's no boning at any of the seams of this garment. It is left very, very soft, but just really nicely finished. The center back is honestly kind of weird. I think this was just altered and taken in a little bit. I can't even describe to you what it, it's just weird. It's like they hacked off one side of it and then they've kind of basted it shut. It's it's weird. I This is like the only alteration that I can really see in this thing. And it's a very weird quick one. It doesn't really affect the appearance of it because the center back seems hidden underneath the Watteau pleat that uh, is in the back. So we don't even see the weirdness that's going on. Obviously this thing wasn't supposed to go under a lot of pressure. It's not going to be a super tight fit, so I guess it was fine. The alteration doesn't look like super modern, you know? It doesn't look like something from like the 50s or the 40s. It just kind of looks like this weird thing that they had to fix and do. The buttonholes are of course hand done in silk. The buttons are just black silk covered metal flat buttons, nothing special. Some darts over the bust to help with fitting over the bust. Two darts in the front. She's an eight piece bodice. So she has her center back, her side back, side piece, and then the front. She has her hanger tabs, which are great. So this is interesting. I'm seeing this more and more. Oh my goodness. Hello. Anchor you to this. <laughs> A little better there, goodness, my my. She has a dart here because sometimes depending on how your bust is shaped and how large your bust is, I deal with this a lot. You get gapping right right here in this section of your armpit and your arms eye, like right where the fold is. And so one of the ways that people deal with this is just by taking a little dart there and then it's tapered out. So she has a little dart there. She also has a dart here where the fabric is going up over her bust. Clearly she had something of a bust that needed to be dealt with when it comes to fitting. Now what really sucks about this gown and I'm sad about it is that at some point in time, some Someone decided that she didn't need her collar anymore and so their collar has just been hacked off and not nicely done either so the neck is completely raw and just a mess you can see how nice this what the front part was finished it was gathered and then bound and in a tape and stitched down so it's a nice clean edge but the stuff that was in the collar is just destroyed and not taken care of at all so her sleeves are really great they have smocking up at the shoulder a little puff and then they're just kind of nice and soft and full so the sleeve itself is fitted and then all of this zhuzhane was just done on top of it. So it has a plain cotton lining that then has had the gathering, the smocking, the puffs added to it. So it's really, really pretty. It is very artistic. It's very similar actually to how the sleeve is cut in that Frith portrait. The cuff is tarlatan. It's a pretty stiff tarlatan actually with the printed cotton on, on the outside and then this the plain cotton on the inside. Um, we do have this very faint embroidery not faint that's not the right word but just really small embroidery and it's hand done just with, with silk twist of just kind of this sort of vine motif i don't know why it, it's really hard to notice honestly like it's not really visible before you say anything no it's not like something else was on there and it's been picked off like we would see the scarring of that this is just how they did it which is kind of interesting but so just a little hand touch i mean if, if this was someone who was interested in aesthetics and aestheticism then having that little touch of embroidery and especially since it looks natural and it kind of looks like a twig or a vine it's like maybe that was just their way of kind of adding that artistic touch that artistic flair to this garment i don't know but i mean trying to come up with the thought process here that's kind of what i can come up with. She also has this beautiful lace edging going around the neck all the way down the front on both sides. Uh, you see this kind of treatment with tea gowns, it's really, really common. And as a tea gown, it is a princess cut line dress. So what that means is that it's all cut in one. It doesn't have a separate bodice or a separate skirt. Again, if you look at the Frith portrait, very, very similar in how that was done. <laughs> now down here at the hem. So she's lined in this dark chocolatey brown polished cotton. And that weird running stitch thing just kind of it goes all the way down. So the center back seam of the skirt is this running stitch down. That's just how they did it. And then her hem is actually faced in about what? Four inches or so of orange worsted wool. She has an interlining of black lightweight tarlatan. So that's what they have to kind of hold the skirt out and to give it some body and some structure. The worsted wool makes sense too when you think about it because the, the worsted wool is gonna have more sturdiness 
close to it, it's gonna be much harder wearing, especially since the silk is very, very lightweight and delicate. The only problem with this wool is that it has been destroyed by moths. Now the front here, this little floaty bit that we kind of keep moving around because she's huge, it kind of gets in the way. She is just placed over the front, which is in that brown cotton. So she's not tacked down. The underside of this in this, in this part here is just brown cotton to save on fabric. The front has piecing of the printed silk and it's like super uneven and kind of messy and not really nicely done, but it works. She's also just kind of tacked here along the front at intervals to not stress the fabric. So this whole thing is just selvage to selvage one long length and she is just actually running stitched by hand underneath the printed silk onto the brown cotton. So very light stitches, very delicate stitches. So then that way the silk is not super stressed because if you were machine sewing all of this, that needle going through the silk so many hundreds of thousands of times, it's gonna basically make it shatter and perforate. So doing hand stitches, running stitches with big silk thread and larger stitches at that, it's gonna help preserve the silk so it doesn't fall apart as quickly. Um, I know that might seem counterintuitive if you're not a sewer, but when you're dealing with lightweight fabrics like this, you actually don't want to over sew it because it can, basically if you think about like, you know, notebook paper, it has all those little holes as perforations and you can tear it. That's what a sewing machine can do to really lightweight fabrics. The printed silk here is just stitched normal. That was treated as one. So it's just this front panel here where we have a little bit of trickery happening to make it go together a lot easier. As with the front, the back is treated the same, so she is symmetrical. But a signature of this style, and one of the things that makes this gown really special, is the fact that she has her Watteau pleat. Now, I'm gonna say this, I will only use Watteau pleat in this context. We do not call pleats of sackback gowns in the 18th century Watteau pleats. That is a Victorianism, that is not the correct term. They're actually just box pleats. But for this style, this is a Watteau pleat because that's what they called it in the period. And you know, how much I love using period correct terminology. It does have a bit of a train and the back is actually, because this is a Watteau pleat and it's supposed to hang away from the body, we don't have it completely fitted. Like this is left loose, the brown cotton is here. So that way we have that lovely fall away effect. We have a little mending here. She caught it, her, looks like she caught her hip on something. And we have a period mend of just some of the same thread fixing the hole or they had a disaster and that hole got cut when they were sewing and then they tried to fix it. And that's also very deeply relatable. The way that this Watteau pleat, and I'm using big air signs here cause it's not actually pleated. It's actually gathered up at the very back of the neck, probably about the same width as like that knot in the back of our neck where the spine kind of sticks out the most. It's just like an inch or two. I'm also going to assume this is also selvage to selvage. So we have again, a selvage to selvage piece gathered up really, really small at the base of the neck. So that's how you know how fine this fabric is because you can't do that with chunky fabric. Okay, yeah, and this width of fabric is about 23 and a half inches wide. So it's a nice narrow silk fabric, but silk widths like that are actually really, really common in the past. That's, that's it's really normal. You can see that the silk here for the, not the center back, but like almost the center back is brought in really, really deep into the center back. It's basically touching. So then all of this actually just falls away. And then eventually we get a little bit more down here. Um, So that's the back. Let's see, let's get our measurements real fast. I forgot to grab those. Oh, the skirt also has a box pleat in the cotton itself. So we don't see that with the Watteau pleat. The Watteau pleat hides it, but there is a box pleat at the center base, kind of probably right at the waist to the Cossacks area to help that skirt fall away in a very attractive way. And if she had a small bustle pad on underneath of this, because if this is early 1880s, it's not a full bustle like what we see in the 1870s and late 1880s. It's a much more natural looking shape. I'm not gonna say natural form because Kenna will kill me. So yeah, we're looking at probably like a 29 to 30 inch waist on this thing. She definitely a, a lady, right? It's not for a kid. Oh, it's not for a young woman. It's, it's, it's for someone in her mid thirties. <laughs> All right, let's go uh, put her on the mannequin. Okay, so I have mounted her as best as I can, given the circumstances. Homegirl was short. I'm five foot four, and this mannequin is and I are basically shoulder to shoulder, so she's real short. <laughs> Probably about like five foot. 
<laughs> or so. But so what actually makes this interesting is that the size of her waist is somewhere around like 28, 29, 30 inches. She's really short-waisted, so it's actually kind of hard to mount her because her waist is basically at the under boob of this bod of this mannequin. And so it's having a hard time fitting, so I can't actually get it completely buttoned. But for what it is, I'm actually pretty happy with it. So now we can really see what's going on here. It had a hook and eye here, a hook and eye there, and then a hook and eye down here. The hook and eyes are gone. The eye for this one is still there, but it's come unstitched. But then the front just kind of hangs, you know? Like she's just kind of chilling over here. Like it's just draping ever so nicely. Like honestly for me, I want this to kind of be gathered up and like pinned here. And maybe she did that. I don't know. Look how elegant that is. Oh, that looks so nice. And that we're having some tension here. Again, it's just because the boob is in the wrong place. But how it hangs like so and it's just very soft, it's very drapey. She's very, very elegant. Okay, so <laughs> here's what the front looks like when I t undo this, so we have a good idea. She folds away like this, and you can see how she just pins right up the front, obviously the bust issue, but she pins right up the front to the neck, really easy, and then this just folds over and covers everything. So we can see that the buttons, yeah, the lowest buttons actually, at least on me, yeah, it would be about right here, and obviously she's shorter, so around that area. So this is how she would get in and out of it. It's not supposed to be super duper fitted, but it's just a really nice touch there. We have a little bit of the silk here, just as facing. Oh, I forgot to mention this when we had her flat too, but the way that they did the buttons, since this fabric is so lightweight, they actually have it on twill tape. So they've bored the whole, like they've stitched to twill tape here as an additional reinforcement uh, to keep the buttons stable and to prevent it from pulling out of the really lightweight silk and cotton because it's really actually quite thin. This is actually darted here. So this dart goes from the underarm to over the hip for this princess seam so it's not actually just two panels here so this is actually just a very big dart when they made this in addition to the fitting darts at the waist here at the front this piece does not have any pockets she is pocketless so you can see it did have actually a pretty decent train on it it's not doing much because the mannequin is way too tall for how short she is but she clearly rocked a train which means when she walked this would pull out so you can see how full this is here like this is just gorgeous oh this is so gorgeous and so like yeah then this would just pull away and having the wool facing at the bottom what that's gonna do like I said it's gonna protect the hem of the skirt but it's also gonna give it just a little bit of weight so that way it kind of flows a little bit nicely more nicely around her as well we can see the smocking here the puffing here the fullness down here into the cuff so again that artistic aesthetic looking silhouette, very, very fashion forward for when this thing was made. All right, so now we can see what the back looks like, how she's just, how it's super small up here. Do you guys see that? And then it just flows away like so. This is just gorgeous that way. That fullness of the skirt coming in from the goring and the shaping done here. She was quite the thing. Look at her, ma'am. All right, guys, well, that's it for me. Uh, I hope that you all enjoyed having a look at this tea gown and learning a little bit more about tea gowns. I will see you all back here next week with a new video. And until then, I hope you all have an amazing rest of your week. Mwah. Bye.